talking about national development planning. In fact, we're hosting some members of the team from the National Development Planning Commission. Now, what are they going to be telling us about? It's all about the sustainable development goals, how far we have come, our voluntary national report, and what the way forward is going to be. There are some interesting dynamics in this report that we're going to be exploring with our guests this morning. Dr. Felix Addo, your board de deputy director and advisor, joins uh, the conversation. He's advisor, SDG's advisory unit office, of the president. We also have Gladys Osabute, head UN System and Foundations Unit uh, with the MOF. Thank you, uh, lady. Thank you, gentlemen, for joining the conversation. Thank you. So let's, let's kick start this. I know definitely Gladys will be telling us a lot about what our expectations have been over time when it comes to the SDGs and how we are performing. But let me start with you, Felix. Uh, tell us, how is the NDPC faring? It's not too long ago that I came and spoke to uh, Dr. Esim. Yes, and uh, here we are again having another interaction. But how is the, the NDPC faring generally? Well, I'll say the NDPC is faring quite well. Um, keeping focus on its mandate of mm. coordinating development activities, uh, monitoring, evaluating, and reporting on our development agenda. And I think that's part of the conversation this morning, with the um, SDGs being a critical component of the national development agenda. Mm. And in terms of the SDGs, uh, where would you say we find ourselves currently as a country? Just give us a, a, a general overview. General overview, I think we, we've made very significant progress, um, but there's still a lot more to be done. And uh, the current issue of the COVID-19, the conflict in Ukraine has had a, an adverse effect on, our, on the implementation of the SDGs. But um, we are still focused. We believe that the SDGs are still the way to go in coming out of the COVID pandemic. And so we, we, we resolute and would give it our best shot. All right, you're resolute, you'll give it to your best shot. Let me come to Gladys. For you, looking at where you're coming from in the UN system, and of course, these set up to ensure that countries would be able to catch up generally with those global standards. Uh, how well would you say Ghana has fared when it comes to achieving the sustainable development goals? Thank you very much. I think, um, as Doc said, we are on course, even though there is um, a room for improvement. We started implementing the SDGs in January 2016, after it had been adopted in uh, 2015. We were on course. First, it is um, completely aligned. The SDGs are completely aligned to our national goals, mm. our national framework, development framework. So we don't have SDG standing alone. The activities achieving the SDGs standing alone. So they are integrated? They are integrated. So right. as we undertake our developmental agenda, we are already implementing the SDGs. We were doing well um, in terms of education enrollment, in terms of um, gender parity, especially in the basic school. Our flagship program, Free SHS, we had already um, met that target though, before the COVID sets in. Mm. So five years of implementation. Which, which target specifically? The gender parity. Gender parity. All oh, right, right. Gender parity, the, even the enrollment, I think, with the school enrollment, especially at the secondary school level, because of the free SHS, we, we were there. Then, unfortunately, 2020, mm. COVID set in. And that affected the investment that had to go into the implementation of the SDGs. And so together with the whole world, we are looking back to see how we can build better. And uh, that is what we all had when we went to New York this year. To present, I must also add that Ghana, within the eight years of implementation of the SDGs, we've done two voluntary national reviews. The voluntary national reviews um, this, the, this, the is the second, this is the second. This is the second that Ghana right. has done it. Right. Member countries are encouraged to come and give account of how their implementation of the SDGs have been. Mm. And then, so you come, you tell your story, and then you have your colleague countries critiquing and asking questions, basically for you to learn from each other. So this year, Ghana went to the UN to present its second voluntary national reviews on the implementation 
of the SDGs. And uh, I'm sure as we go on, we will know what is going to happen to the report. <laughs> the re one of the reasons why we are here, making sure that people um, open the interest and people get to know more about the SDGs and what Ghana is doing to achieve them. On that very point, have we done enough, do you feel? I mean, th this is just a broad conversation, but sometimes you ask yourself, have we done enough in sensitizing our own population when it comes to the SDGs? I mean, if you were to walk onto the street, how many people, even those that you might consider uh, of a certain academic or economic class, would be able to tell you anything fundamental about the SDGs? How have we been able to weave this into the fabric of our national life, because I feel that that is a starting point, isn't it? That, that, that is very critical, and uh, a lot of awareness creation um, activities have, have been conducted, but it was um, targeted initially, looking at media people, development planners, public sector, um, actors, and even the private sector. But the, like, like you said, there's still a lot to be done. Some initiatives, especially from the Office of the President, has focused on mass education, we've done um, Takra Day in the Western region, we've done Kufuridia, Volta region, and other initiatives. But I must say that um, this is where the concept of partnership comes in. Mm. Um, NDP, your Ministry of Finance, cannot reach the entire country by ourselves. And that's where we forge in partnerships with media, with civil society organizations, so that in every corner of the country where we, we get, we find ourselves, we will be able to put out the message of the SDG. So probably it's a challenge to Joy, Joy FM to um, pick up the mantle and support of the awareness creation. We've actually done a lot on that in, in previous years, and we yeah. still continue to do so. But it right. interests me. Uh, of course, I'm sure you collaborate as well with the NCCE, especially yeah. as their focal area is dissemination yeah. of, of the sort. But let's get into the report proper. This is the second one, the second voluntary national report like right. you've uh, put forward. And interestingly, the very first one of the SDGs talks about poverty, eradicating it in all its forms. Which brings me to an interesting development that is evinced from this report. The fact that on the back of COVID-19, about a quarter of uh, you know, our population has been affected because if you look at 25%, then about a quarter of them have been impacted in terms of poverty, the reduction of their standards of living yeah. within this period. This being the very first uh, you know, SDG target and, and how COVID has impacted us. What really does the report have to say on that? And, and did it come as any surprise to you, Doc? Um, no, in terms of the poverty figures, no, because it, um, globally that was the trend. Um, several millions of people were pushed into poverty as a result of the COVID. Mind you, there were lots of jobs, um, et cetera, food insecurity, all these issues um, <coughs> pushed people beyond the poverty line. So um, I was not surprised. Probably what, um, for me, um, I, I was expecting that the figure would be probably a, a bit higher than 25% to that. Oh, wow. Yeah, because um, before... COVID, um, the poverty level in Ghana was around 24%. Right. So it's not, it's not gone up. It's, it's, not, it's just a marginal increase. A marginal increase. In other, in other countries, it's been a significant increase in poverty. And that goes to tell of the effectiveness of some of the initiatives that were put in, especially during the COVID period, to support businesses, to support um, individual households that really cushioned a lot of households and uh, reduce the numbers, I should say. Mm. And that's, that's an interesting uh, development because if you look at other jurisdictions, I mean, across the world, it's been shown that those who were poor were pushed further Correct. down Correct. You know, into the vicious poverty cycle. I remember back then, just about a year, year and a half ago, even in the UK, there was talk about how the most vulnerable, the, the poor ones, were being crushed by... COVID-19. So I guess we have weathered the storm pretty well. Um, we haven't fared that badly. Uh, what I don't know, though, is how this poverty has impacted SDG2, for example, which talks about hunger, food security, and improved nutrition, and also promoting sustainable agriculture. I want to take them apart so we look at how we're faring across the different uh, you know, strata of our national life. Is, is that something you'd like to take, Ladis? Yes, um, and then a little bit um, on the, 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 the poverty, the, the interventions. Mm. Why our um, poverty numbers are better than the global figures? If um, you're, you, are, you, you, lo you lose your job, but you are getting water, 
free. Right. You are getting electricity free. Mm. That alone, at least, maintains your dignity. Mm. So you, it will not be as worse as when you've lost your job and you can't get water to bath, you can't get water to drink. Mm. So we need to appreciate the type of interventions that government puts in place. Coming to go to the food security, you know we had done very well with the planting for food and jobs and other things. And we were, as a nation, we were almost enjoying bumper harvest, a lot of food on the system. But the isolations, the, 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 what, what they call the lockdowns, the food that had to be transported to the various places could not come. We heard the stories about egg glots in Kumasi, if you saw what was happening. So people in the production So chain, glots when it comes glots, to eggs? Yes, the eggs. And mm. they, they, when, when was this? They, 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 during the COVID period, during the lockdown. Right. And remember, the woman came on TV to come and show the, I mean, thousands of plates of eggs that had gone wrong, mm -hmm. uh, gone bad, and pleading basically for government to come to the intervention. So this is one of the reasons. But when, uh, in, the, in the, the, the type of financing system that we have in the production chain, if you have your uh, funds being completely wiped off, then getting back to the production chain becomes an issue. Mm. So currently, even though we have food in the production areas, getting them into the markets have become an issue. And so we are seeing prices escalations going up. The, what the government has done currently is to encourage the, 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 bomb, the, the, the commodity. The, this company that is buying the, uh, <coughs> exchange group, yeah. exchange group to, to get into the market centers, the production centers, to ensure that whatever is produced, at least as at now. They are oh, you're referencing it. what uh, President Takufuado has been speaking, speaking of, about. which has been uh, discussed with some, some issues, by the way. But, by the but way, yes, about maybe one aspect of resolving One, one aspect of it. So if we are talking about zero hunger as mm -hmm. of now, mm -hmm. we have to look at the entire value chain. That's why we are saying in that. The people who are producing should be encouraged to continue producing. Mm -hmm. They should be encouraged. They should be, um, they, they, they should be, they should have the, the back end that when they produce, it will be what they will, mm -hmm. not, they will not go. Mm -hmm. And then also the funding. Those who have lost their funds, all their funds being wiped out. Right. We should find a way. And that is what the, the, the Obatanpa project is doing, initiative is mm. doing, to make sure that everybody in the production chain, be it agric and other sectors, are getting some support to be able to go back to what they were doing before. Mm. Uh, coming to you, Doc, on the bit about ending hunger, what would you say our current situation is when it comes to hunger? We've spoken about poverty, yeah. but what, what are the percentages? What is the, the rate when it comes to hunger yeah. in Ghana? And, and how, what would you say this report reveals when it comes to that specific uh, this, issue? This the second uh, goal, basically. Yeah, yeah, thank you. So this report shows that there's been a marginal increase in the um, proportion of the population that are... Um, experiencing food insecurity. Mm. And there are two dimensions of it, the severe food insecurity and then the moderate food insecurity. And what that means is that these people um, are not able to afford three square meals on a regular basis. Mm. Um, sometimes it's seasonal um, some because um, there's not enough food in the system. But generally, we've seen that uh, in 2020, there was a marginal increase in the number of people or the proportion of the population that um, experienced some form of food insecurity. Mm -hmm. And very, very much aligned to what uh, Mrs. Osabote said, um, had to do with the, getting the food from the production centers to where the food is needed. Let me just get to uh, this point. I want to give the specific detail uh, that you mentioned in that specific regard for point two. I'm just looking for the page. Yes, yeah, so there you have it. And according to the report, in terms of the prevalence of moderate or severe food insecurity, 
the proportion of the population experiencing moderate to severe food insecurity based on food insecurity and experience scale declined from 49.5% in 2017 to 47.7% in June 2020 and 47% in September 2022. But on the back of COVID-19, yeah. on the back of the Russo-Ukrainian war, we've seen an uptick in uh, the figures. Of course, this is our second survey, like you mentioned. But currently, so what do you say? Is it the current statistic? Because this isn't so reflective yes, yes. of so, what so we're experiencing yeah, now. Current situation. The mm. Current situation. That is the current situation. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. So let's move from there to talk about um, one issue that today, for example, just tied to that conversation, is stunting in children, which which your report covers as well. In fact, today I'm bringing that up because there's another program, the University of uh, Ghana Department of Food and all of that, together with other agencies, are having um, a discourse on that. When it comes to stunting among children five years or younger, per your report, it stood at 22.7% in 2011. And uh, when you look at the latest figures, in 2017, it had been brought down to 17.5%. How, how, how significant is this in terms of uh, our national life and in terms of achieving SDG 2? Uh, it is a very significant improvement of the situation. And I'd, I'd like to look at it not just within the context of SDG 2, but even within the context of child development. When a child is stunted, meaning the child is more, um, has malnutrition issues, it affects uh, various forms of development, not just the physical development, but even the, the um, psychological development. Um, every facet and, of the child's yes, every, life. Every, and education. in the long term, it, it affects the child's productivity mm -hmm. and ability to make meaningful contribution to the economy. So seeing uh, that big decline in, um, in Stanton, for me, it's, it's a good indicator that we are doing well, um, not just in its contribution towards SDG2, but then within the bigger picture of national development. I'll come to Gladys. You started talking about um, education and how we've made it even more inclusive, the gender parity situation. What, what have we achieved within the last, let's say, four or five years on the educational front in terms of reducing the gender inequality, Gladys? And what more can we expect as far as this is concerned? It, you know, putting it into the context of the SDGs. Thank you very much. I think with the gender parity, currently at the basic, before we get to the secondary school, the reports show that we have, the, the females have even outnumbered mm -hmm. males. Mm -hmm. And this is a very good news because it also impacts on Go5, that is the gender issue. It also means that once our girls are in school and they are taking their studies seriously, they are going to move higher. Than. We are already building the middle level manpower mm. with this idea. The secondary schools are also doing very well because we know the numbers. I know there are issues about quality. I can see that you are coming to ask me about that. <laughs> but don't, don't get there yet. Don't get there yet. You see, when you get one woman right. to get the basics in education, mm. you know what Quijo Agri Quijo Agri Quijo Agri says. said. Right. But it even goes more than that. The lady is the young lady is in school. She's not at home to become pregnant. So in a way, she's already breaking the poverty cycle. Mm. And that one is over. That's why we keep saying that the SDGs are interlinked. Right. If you yeah. get education and all the basics in education right, it, it impacts uh, positively on poverty. Mm. It impacts hunger. Those children who are going to school, you know, free, free SHS, they are being fed properly. Mm. If they are at home, they are not going to get those things. They are going to get themselves pregnant. They are going to perpetuate the poverty cycle. So for me, as long as my women, we are, we are getting the parity improved, and my women, my girls are in school, I'm happy about it. And I believe that the president himself is very happy. You know, he's also the gender champion for the yes, AU agenda. I am aware. So mm. it, it, it is a very big good news for those of us who are, I'm not a gender activist, <laughs> but I support <laughs> women's development. Mm. So for me, it is a good thing. And I believe that if we are able to sustain it, no matter what the challenges are, at the end of the day, it will help us. I'm going to box you into a tight corner, and I gave you fair warning yes. before this conversation. <laughs> but, but, but the point is, even as we talk about these things that are 
very development oriented and no one can say that free SHS for example isn't a good thing but looking at our economic context because whatever development because I'm we, coming we, from Minister of Finance yes we bring to bear <laughs> must be put into the context of the resources available and what we have at our disposal to look, to expand on them in recent times owing to our economic downturn let's put it that way we've had to contend with numerous ideas coming forth about how to deal with free SHS one of those that I was talking about only yesterday had to do with Dr. Steve Manteo, formerly of the PIAC, who made mention of the fact that, look, to sustain ourselves and ensure that it is a win-win situation across the board, how about you have, if you opt for boarding education, then you, the parent, bear the cost of feeding. There have been different dynamics about retooling, reassessing free SHS. What do you think about an assessment, which we've not got so far, and this suggestion when it comes to at least parents, the little you can do is contribute. If you opt for boarding for your child, pay for feeding. What do you, what do you make of it? I think both of you can address it. I think if I, I can start and then Dr. Um, we'll, we'll add on. The government position is that every child of secondary school going age should be in secondary school. And the government also realized that there are some parents who will not be able to afford. So the government position is that affordability should not be the, the, the issue why students who can be in school. So that is government position. You are asking about the economic situation. I think a lot of um, people have expressed their views. As a government official, I will say that I stand and work for the government position. I, will have, I can have a private position, just like my, my minister had some time ago, and uh, you know, uh, people started bashing at him. Is your private position different from your uh, official position? If you ask me, I would say yes. Okay. And I would say that, I will, I, yes, because there are parents who can afford. Right. And I remember there was one minister who said, why should I get free education for my child at secondary school when I can pay for 20 people? Right. So, that, that, that is it. But again, the issue of targeting. I think the government position has been how to target, to know, and pinpoint the people who cannot afford. And that is what we are working on. That towards. is the difficulty. That, that, I believe so. I believe so. So we, make, we made it blanket for everybody, which is actually creating holes in our budget, if you ask me from my private It's creating position. holes in our budget. If you ask me from, that, from, 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 from my private position. Do you think we should get to the point where we streamline it so that we're able to target, like you're saying. Because once we know the poverty levels, once we know those within a certain bracket, then we can say, you know what, Gladys doesn't qualify. Uh, maybe Dr. Adoyobo doesn't qualify. Maybe Benjamin doesn't qualify. But Mama Pats qualifies. So she must be in there. Precisely. Should we get to that point? Yes. But how do we get to that point without a review? So we, I'm sure we are going to have a review. Mm. We believe sincerely that, no, we find that, that, that we are, there's, go, there's, going, to, there's yeah. going to be a... The, the reason I ask is we heard from the Director General of the Ghana Education Service say something about a review. Then we heard roundly that from the ministry, no review. It, it's been confusing for some people. Like I said, the premise is very good policy. But of course, the implementation sometimes, there are bottlenecks. Maybe Doc would also come in at this point. Yeah, no, um, I think um, within the um, public um, policy space, um, if you look at the public policy cycle, um, there's always opportunities for review. And because you come in with the policy, you draw plans to implement, you monitor and evaluate, and then you improve on what, what, what is happening. So um, somewhere along the line, the issue of um, review and improving what, um, what is going on will, will come, come on. But um, importantly, on the issue of targeting, which I also do agree with, um, it's important, but targeting is driven by data. And that is where we need to work a lot more on our data systems. How do we, you just can't look at someone by the face and judge whether the person is rich or poor. Um, we need to have a robust system to be able to assess people's income levels, to be able to um, identify whether they meet the minimum criteria and therefore should be supported or not. And these are things that um, need very credible and reliable data. And uh, initiatives such as the digitalization, the national identity cards, the, the LEAP system, um, 
the right. household registry. Livelihood empowerment. Exactly, the household registry that they are putting together. When all these are done, we we'll have a very reliable database to be able to identify who is, who is indeed poor, who needs the service. And I think the targeting will then become more reliable and efficient. Mm. Ben, if I, if I have sure, to ask sure. something, because um, I happen to be in my private capacity, I happen to be on the board of a secondary school. Okay. And there are things that some parents are willing to do. Right. We also, I also have awards in secondary schools. And the schools where the parents have come together, it used to be PTE. Now there are a whole lot of issues. Some, so in the school that I find myself on the board, they are calling it Parent Association, so PE. This whole idea of free SHS has gone into the heads of parents that even PTA do, they said, no, government says everything is free. Come and contribute something small for the house that your, your ward is to improve upon it. Hey, then they will go and report the headmistress. The government says everything should be free. So for now, whilst the government is paying for the big ticketed items, mm. the feeding, the lodging, you are, the government is already paying the, the fees, the, the salaries for the education sector workers, teachers inclusive. I think there are a few things that we can systematically relieve the government of, then the parents will take them over. Mm. Why don't you pay for the PTA dues? Why right. don't you pay for that? Let's but but the PTAs themselves have been, you know, no, but because roundly of the free SHS. Br brought out of, out, out of the system. In fact, if not stampeded out of the system. <laughs> that is why some parents now in some schools want to do certain things even, but it appears the mechanisms of how to do it, that, that, that has been, you know, problematic. So, but at least that's, I, my suggestion is that that could be a good point to start, mm. where the parents are encouraged to do what we would normally do and we are willing to do. Right. Both the ability and the willingness are there. Mm. So why should you stop me? Meanwhile, the funds that are coming to support those initiatives are, are struggling to come in. Mm. So we can start with that. That would be my proposition, if you ask me. Right. And that's, that's, that's quite a proposition uh, you make there. I like the fact that you're being blunt, you're being very candid about the situation. And of course, we've had our own challenges with the buffer stock we've, and, and provision of food and all of that. That is where uh, the context in which some of these are coming uh, forward. But Doc, coming back to you, so on another point of gain, goal six, where it talks about availability of water, where it talks about sustainability of saying, where it talks about sanitation. And we have a minister designated for that, interestingly. Uh, Cecilia Abnadapa, yeah. the Minister for Water, uh, Sanitation and Water Resources. How would you say we are fair there? When I look at the figures you present in this report, 92.2% of households have access to improved drinking water sources in 2021. I do not know whether there's been an advancement since in 2022 we've not covered the entire year and we don't have a full report on that. But I pose this question in context. There is also in achieving the SDGs the context of open defecation and how much it costs <laughs> us as a country. Yeah. There is the context of maybe illegal mining and all of that and how it affects turbidity levels of our water and all of that. In recent times, it's one of the, the, the reasons the Ghana Water Company Limited has cited in pushing for an upward review. And now we've heard that they are going to get, what, 21.15%. Uh, so put it into that context. How are we faring? Um, okay, so hey, it's very um, that very. I've, I've put it in. Uh -huh. yeah. so let, let me try and then um, pick pick them up. In terms of access to to water, yes, we've seen um, an improvement in those that have access to improved drinking water sources. Right. Yeah. Um, the issue um, of Galamse um, destroying our water bodies um, mm. is increasing the cost of treating the water and it affects the availability of the, of the service. So yes, you could have access to improved drinking source of water, which is the pipe borne water per se, but you may not get it 24 hours a day because of these challenges that we're experiencing with um, the, 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 the turbidity levels and therefore increased cost um, of treatment. And then also, I mean, the issue of um, um, sprawling development that also makes it uh, very difficult for um, Ghana Water, for instance, to extend services to all, all these places. Um, issue, let me pick up on issue of open defecation. Mm. Yeah, we've seen a marginal drop. I think it's now around 18%, if, if, if I remember, from 20%. Uh, There's been a marginal drop, that I know. Yes. It's not substantial. Yeah. Yes, a very marginal drop in, in open defecation. 
which is something that it's one of the priorities of the Ministry of Sanitation to, together with its partners, to help improve access to decent um, toilet facilities in the whole in the homes, and then also in schools, in hospitals, and within the communities to help curb the incidence of open defecation, which has other ramifications because it leads, it, has, it is a public health issue mm. to start with, and uh, it's it's interesting that for probably three years now, there's not been an outbreak of chorilla mm. in, in, in the country, which goes to show that um, that regular interface between humans and human feces, which will literally cause chorilla, is, is on a decline, mm. and uh, something good is happening in that area. But um, to wrap up on the issue of um, water quality, I think it's something worth talking about, because it was also in the news recently with sachet water and uh, other um, other um, sources. I was just about to get to that. <laughs> <laughs> so um, the the survey and the report a report touches on it that a vast majority of Ghanaians rely on bottled or packaged water as a drinking water source, and that raised the issue of we being interested in the quality of what people are consuming now. And uh, yes, some research what Ghana Statistical Service did show that there were incidences where um, the household water was contaminated. But that, that is the issue. Um, they tested household water. And what needs to be dissected is where did the contamination take place? Did it take place during the production or at the storage or how the water is managed at the household level? And I think we need to do some bit of work into that because if practices at the household level increases contamination level, then we are at risk of a huge um, public health and some education needs to go on in that area. How do we store water properly at the home? How do we use water properly in the home? Is there a drive that you're undertaking to maybe boost sensitization in that respect? Well, um, we, we, we first need to understand what, what is happening, whether the issue is really at the household level and what are the causes of the situation at the household level, then based on that, we'll come up with some um, measures to mitigate that, be it advocacy, be it um, training, whatever it needs to be done. Mm. I'll pose this question to both of you. I'll start with you, Gladys, but I want us to address it from different angles. I want to fuse together as we wrap with the SDGs and focus on the launch, uh, SDGs 9 and 11. So 9 focuses on building resilient infrastructure, promoting inclusive and sustainable industrialization, and fostering innovation. 11 has to do with making cities and human settlements inclusive, safe, resilient, and sustainable. And that's quite a package in there because we have people building on waterways, we have people in earthquake-prone zones, and then we're talking about infrastructure. I would have you focus on the financial aspect of things, but for you, uh, we can look at the year of roads, for example. Right before you came in today, we had uh, you know, one of our, we've been having one of our um, documentaries that focuses on the year of roads and how people feel that is not exactly showing up. This is about the third year back to back that we've had a year of roads, if I'm not mistaken. Right. Year of roads, year of your roads, year of roads. So our infrastructure development, taking into context, for example, health infrastructure in some places that are not even being used, that are rotting away. So let's put it into that context. How much ground have we covered? How much more ground do we have to cover when, realistically, when it look, we look at infrastructure? Also in there would be availability of housing. <laughs> so it's, I'm trying to encapsulate as much as possible uh, what we can put into this. I'll come to you and then I'll come to Gladys on the financing aspect. Right, uh, infrastructure, um it's very critical for, for development. Um, I see it as a vehicle through which development um, takes place, um, mm. be it um, transportation infrastructure, be it housing, be it um, social facilities like hospitals, even police stations, etc. Um, some work has been done. Um, we, yes, we, we head of the year of roads, and uh, a lot of roads uh, constructions are underway. But I think it's the it's the, diff the gap between the expectation and then what we, we are seeing on the ground. And, uh, Is that gap a big one from what you see infrastructure-wise? I, um, I think um, 
based on the public expectation, yes, uh, the public expected more um, in, in the provision of critical infrastructure. Um, the government took a very bold decision to step up its efforts on infrastructure by not only looking at, for instance, um, roads alone, looked at rail, um, some ports initiatives, and then even housing, which is a critical thing because the housing deficit is um, in the millions in, in this country. And uh, that needs to be tackled. The, maybe before even going to the, uh, the um, financing bit, which is one of the main big constraints to infrastructure development in the country, also has to do with sometimes issues about the, around the land tenure system. Mm. So for instance, with the Agenda 111 hospitals, which is a brilliant thing, there are some districts that there are still uncertainties on where to site the hospitals. And that is one of the um, challenges we have. Our land tenure system does not readily um, make it easy for development to take place. And you spoke about um, people building in waterways, which um, has to do with development control. The rules are in place, um, but as always, we have challenges with enforcing these regulations. And then also, the I think um, the the average Ghanaian should also take responsibility for some of these things because it's it's pretty obvious that you are not supposed to build on a waterway. You don't need anyone to bring a cane or a gun. The question ahead. usually is how they get permission to build. And if they don't have permission, how they can go on for so long, maybe even complete whatever construction, yeah. before it is realized that they that built on a waterway. waterway. So yeah. those are systemic problems. The systemic right? issues has to do with the, um, the resources to do the monitoring, go be out in the field to identify who is building. And uh, there are instances of people building at night and within, within a few weeks, huge structures coming up. But there are also logistics issues and being able to um, go over, go around the country to identify these buildings. But I think um, as a general public, as Ghanaians, we should um, take some responsibility for doing some of these obviously wrong things that um, the country tends to suffer from. Flooding or case, and then it's not just the wrongdoer, but then everybody downstream or around the area suffers, and uh, mm. I think that is just not right. And that bit you mentioned about flooding fits into another SDG, talking about climate, the environment, how we manage it uh, to ensure that we do not keep seeing what we see, for example, in the crowd, year in, year out, flooding. And that uh, we can deal with, but I guess we'll save that conversation for another day. But let's come to the financing end of things, infrastructure development, where we find ourselves. The gap is yawning. What more should we do in the financing end of things to close the gap? Ben, I think before we talk about the specifics, we need to know that um, unlike the MDGs, where we the developed Millennium, the Millennium Development, Development Goals, goals where right. we yeah. developed the goals and expected somebody from somewhere to come and give money to them, developing or emerging economies for them to undertake their developmental agenda. The SDGs, and that is the whole idea of sustainability. If you talk about sustainability, that means that you have your plan and you are also in control of the funds that are going to be used to develop the plans. Otherwise, they can never be sustainable. So the SDGs came up with two main means of implementation. That this Ababa Action Agenda, the quadruple aim, which basically looks at the various areas, seven thematic areas, through which, mm. and when you look at the seven thematic areas under the quadruple aim, you see that the first is domestic public, right. domestic resources, so public domestic resources. Meaning that as a nation, you have to get enough, <coughs> sorry, to do your development, then you can go and ask for help. Mm. The second one has to do with internal, uh, private sector investment that is both domestic and for me, before we talk about ODE, so we realize that ODE in the current sustainable system has been watered down, watered down. So we are talking about domestic resource mobilization. Of course, for the infrastructure, we have the infrastructure fund that the government has set up. But then for the, the monies that government will put into the infrastructure fund, it's a percentage of the total envelope. Mm. So if you have your total envelope, not mean big enough or not growing the way you expected it to be. We were doing very well with growth under the COVID. Last year we did 41%. This year we are expecting to do 5.5. 5. 
Yes. Last year, last year, one. Yes. So once the economic growth and the the the, 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 the inflows are coming in then we'll be able to put enough in the infrastructure fund right. to be able to use it for the infrastructure. So if the sector is suffering from, as Doc said, from um, resources, it is because the general envelope is not getting enough. And that means that as a nation, we should all support the tax improvement systems that government wants. The fiscal space will have to be. Expanded, widened, widened. Because it, it is also a reality is there, is that there, is there, is there some people that are also being overburdened. I, yes, in recent I'm sure times, you and I, being I, I, <laughs> I took a look at. Sometimes I do that. Whether you go and eat somewhere and they give oh, you the. Okay. When you take a look at it, recently I went somewhere and purchased something less than 200 CDs. The tax component alone, levies and all of that, was about 31 point something CDs. Just imagine that under 200 CDs. So I think some checks and balances in there, a widening of the net, right. but of course that, that will not be done by me. That will be done by but, uh, the GRA yes, and ben, ben, so I'm, I'm saying this to ensure that so, and already I know your FM, you've been partnering Ministry of Finance exactly. to do all the dissemination before the budget, we go around, we do stakeholder consultation. So some of these things you've been helping with the dissemination. So basically to say that we should realize that nobody is coming to develop this nation for us. Mm. We need the resources. And talking about partnership, the goal 17, we are talking about value addition partnership. We don't want to take our plate to go and beg for aid. Aid has never developed anybody. Right. We know it will never do. So we are talking about partnership. If you are going into enter into a value addition partnership, it means you have something substantial in your hand. What have you been able to mobilize domestically? with which you will take to the table, right. somebody else will bring his or hers, we miss it, then you can have a bigger say how it is shared. Mm. If you do not do that, then you are just going to pick your bowl and go begging. And when you go and beg, you'll be given peanuts. It will not be able to do anything to, to bridge the infrastructure gap. And then also the other, other things. You have not told oh. me about the housing units that are hiding at places that have me, so I will not talk about them. But housing is also a big issue when you come to infrastructure development. Mm. And as a nation, I think we have the right intentions. But when we start, we have to finish. I think we have the right intentions, but wrong implementation on so many of our, our policies. And that yeah, was why I, I brought up that. the bit about housing. <laughs> no, I did. Uh, that, that is why I brought up the bit about housing. But I guess over time, we, we would find a way of dealing with all of these situations. Now, to wrap the conversation, it is clear that the VNR, the Voluntary National Report, is crucial. And kudos to your team, your outfit, Dr. Adoyobo, for coming out with this second uh, one. But in line with that, the implementation committee, there also is a launch that is coming up on the 19th of yes, August. Right. And His Excellency the President will be there? Yeah. Yes. Tell us a bit about that. Right. So the Voluntary National Review is uh, part of the accountability me mechanisms for country to own up and then... Um, um, tell the world how they're implementing the SDGs. But the whole idea is to foster learning, experience, sharing, um, good practices um, mm. around the world. And like you said, this is Ghana's second voluntary national review, which did not only look at the implementation of the 17 SDGs, but it looked at the enabling environment for implementing the SDGs and then some of the innovations, innovative actions that are going around the, the country. And uh, the report will be launched, uh, like you said, on Friday um, by the His Excellency, the President. But it's not just a launch of a VNR report. We are going to use that to um, revamp the whole discussions around the SDGs. Um, what we realize is the COVID-19 pandemic, um, other pressing issues seems to have taken the shine of the SDGs, but we cannot we cannot just forget about the SDGs. We cannot push it under the carpet. So this event um, would kickstart or revamp discussions around the, the SDGs, um, looks to encourage um, various stakeholders to step up their actions um, for the SDGs, and then to give us a good chance of achieving the SDGs. And uh, I would wrap up by saying that the Voluntary National Review was an inclusive, transparent, and uh, um, accountable process. It involved government, it involved the private sector, civil society organizations, 
the United Nations country team, and then development partners. And it was one of the um, best practices that was showcased in, um, at the, and in New York when the um, VNR was presented as to how the various stakeholders are working together right. to achieve this, um, the global goals, SDGs. Mm. So where is, we know when the event is happening. Where is it happening? How do people, you know, get to catch all the action? I think I, if, yeah. if, if I can pick that. Um, yes, the event is at the International Conference Centre okay. on, on Friday, 1 p.m. Invitations have been sent out. And uh, the responses we are getting from um, the people we have invited is very good, very encouraging. So we mm. know we are going to get a full house. Right. But those of us who are not able to come in person um, will be on Facebook, all the, so, social, Facebook, uh, all uh, all the, social. the social media handles there where you're going to. And then the links will be sent out. Um, so we expect everybody to be part of it. Listen to it yourself live. Don't wait for somebody to come and tell you. And uh, I know you will be there. But then before, before we go, I, I will not uh, be doing justice to the financing aspect if I don't talk about how the private sector has collaborated with government. Right. Government is currently leading in mobilizing the resources. But the private sector has been very, very supportive. Currently, we have the chamber of C uh, CEOs who are rallying behind the president, and they've come up with the idea of SDG delivery fund Okay. Uh, into which um, companies are going to contribute part of their social responsibility budget lines into this fund, and then they will agree with government which specific activities uh, to be used all in, in support of the SDGs implementation. I think I should put this on record. Well, of course, kudos to them for uh, the support. Any final words? Maybe 20 seconds each. <laughs> okay, so I I'll say that um, in the midst of all the um, challenges that we face, COVID-19, um, Russia, Ukraine war, I think the SDGs provides a very credible blueprint to recover from the SD, uh, from the COVID-19 pandemic and all these challenges, and then to set the, the country and the world at large on a sustainable pathway. So let's not throw it under the bin. Let us keep focused and pursue the SDGs with all vigor. Right. Thank you very much. And coming from Ministry of Finance, I wish to say that the Ministry of Finance together with our minister is leading the team the whole country to mobilize every needed resources right. to develop in general and also to implement the SDG. So whenever we come up with policies and issues, please let's support. It's for the general good of all of us. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for joining the conversation. Of course, the uh, 19th is D-Day as we have that launch of a uh, voluntary national report as far as how we're performing when it comes to the SDGs. Uh, is concerned. Joining us for the discussion, we had Dr. Felix Adoyobo, Deputy Director and Advisor, SDG's Advisory Unit, Office of the President, and Gladys Osabute, Head, UN System and Foundations Unit, Ministry of Finance. Once more, thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Well, up next, uh, still to come on the AM show, we're going to be talking about the utility tariff increments and what this implies uh, for us as uh, people. What do you make of the latest increments? Later on the show, on